Let's look at the history of science, or kind of more broadly, the history of Western civilization and science with a biology focus. Um, so the history we're about to look at is painted with a broad brush, right? I'm skipping lots of details. Western biased, because that's where science uh, mostly comes from. And of course, I'm skipping lots of events, lots of people. In terms of this course, you're responsible for the science history topics, not for the purely political topics. They're just for context. I'm not going to put those on exams. First up, um, the first Western civilizations arose in the Middle East in the region of the Tigris and the Euphrates. That's these two rivers here in the Middle East in what is now modern day Iraq. So this is where the first complex divisions of labor, which is one of the definitions for civilizations, um, arise. And the first big empire is the Akkadian Empire, which you've probably never heard of unless you paid close attention um, during this movie. Um, so about 4,000 years ago, Akkad was the world's largest city right there in between the Tigris and Euphrates, and the Akkadian Empire stretched all throughout here. That was then followed by the Assyrian Empire and the Babylonian Empire. You've probably heard of Babylonians. The same part of the world, right? The Middle East, the Tigris, and the Euphrates. And we have kind of a political unification of the people in these regions. The next empire that comes up more recently, this is about 2,600 years ago to about 2,300 years ago, the Persian Empire, again, Middle East, that same part of the world. Now, Persians are from Iran, and they are not Arabs. Persians are distinct from Arabs, and you may have seen them kind of fictionally represented in this movie, um, 300, which is based on actually true events of an attempted Persian invasion of Greece. Meanwhile, the previous empires were happening in the Middle East. Meanwhile, in Greece, the Greek Empire forms. This is about 3,000 years ago up until about 2,000 years ago. Over in Greece, and this empire was greatly expanded by Alexander the Great, who in just about 30 years of life managed to basically conquer much of the known world. But as is often true in history, he didn't set up a good plan for who would run it afterwards. So when he died at a fairly young age, there was a lot of kind of infighting among all the people remaining, and his empire didn't last much um, after that. But at that time, this was the kind of world's largest empire. And again, the thing about these empires is they unify people politically, and they also unify ideas. Right? So if you are living in the Greek Empire, you are essentially forced to think in a particular way based on what the government is telling you to think. Now, during the Greek Empire, we have the first natural philosophers. So the first kind of philosopher of note for our purposes is Plato. Plato lived about 2,400 years ago to about 2,300 years ago. And he invented philosophical ideas of idealism and essentialism concepts that there are ideals or there are essential properties to things. So he came up with this allegory of the cave, which we spoke about earlier in the course, this idea that there are platonic ideals or molds, as he called them, things that were created that exist that are always the same, but we can't quite figure out what they are because they were made by a supernatural creator. We just have to try to figure out what they are from maybe looking at nature and maybe thinking about things. And these ideas that there are these metaphysical ideas or ideals or molds, things have essential properties that never change, this was a very powerful idea that persisted um, almost up until the present. He had a student, Aristotle. Aristotle spent a bit more time um, thinking about nature and a bit less time thinking about just uh, the supernatural creator. And he invented this concept of a thing called the scale of nature, or in Latin, scala naturae. Um, another term for it is the great chain of being. When Aristotle looked at nature, and he looked at the life in nature, he perceived there to be a ladder of life forms with maybe invertebrates at the bottom. And then going up that ladder, you get to kind of better and better animals. And then maybe you get to humans. Then you get to angels or whatever. And then you get to God at the very top. This was a very attractive idea to the people of the time because it kind of makes sense. And of course, it also justified social hierarchy and elitism because why are the educated Greeks in charge of the uneducated Greeks? Well, they're higher on the ladder. Uh, why is it okay to have slaves? Well, because slaves are kind of like humans, but they're a little lower on the ladder, right? So there's a powerful set of kind of selfish beliefs that cause people to really like this as a description of life and the way the universe is. Now, for the purposes of kind of evolution, the important thing here is this begins this overall trend 
by setting up the world as being static, right? Things don't change. And sets up life and organisms as being type logical, right? There are particular types of organisms that were created. They're kind of arranged on a ladder. And then they stay that way. They're always going to stay that way and never change. And this idea is going to last for a really long time until much later we're going to realize that things change and there's lots of variation instead of things all being identical. Um, following the Greek Empire, we have the Roman Republic. This is based in Italy. And the Republic lasted for about 500 years, and it was replaced with the Roman Empire. So just like in Star Wars, we have a Republic taken over by an emperor. The same sort of thing happened in Rome. And Rome was a very, the Roman Empire was very organized, right? They built roads everywhere. And again, the same thing. They imposed their set of beliefs on this whole part of the world. The Western Roman Empire falls about 400 AD, so it lasts about 400 years. Historians argue that maybe the Eastern Roman Empire lasts about another thousand. But the key thing here is, again, this whole part of Europe, this kind of Western civilization, is all under one rule with one person in charge at each time. And the reason why this is so important is you have the Roman Empire in charge, and one of the emperors, Constantine the I, um, his mother became Christian, and then he thought that was a good religion, and he legalizes Christianity in 325 AD. So up until here, for about 300 years, Christianity was a religion, right? It started in the Middle East, kind of spread, but it was a very minor religion. There weren't a lot of Christians, they didn't have a lot of power, they were persecuted. Um, there's a really interesting movie called Agora that you should watch that's kind of set in this time period, it shows this kind of conflict between Romans, Jews, Christians, and a bunch of other groups at the time, Christianity was really not a major force until the emperor legalized it. And of course, when there's an empire and the emperor says this is a good religion, well then that religion basically takes over. And within 300 years, Christianity had become the dominant religion throughout all of Europe, which it had not been before. Right? So you can see in this map there are small pockets of Christianity in 300 years, the whole Western world becomes Christian. And this is important because, again, people think based on their, what their leaders tell them and also what their religion would like them to believe. So you have Europe now unified under a particular religion, which is also a philosophy. All right, so what does Christianity say about history of life and how things worked? Well, special creation from the Bible explains these molds of Plato, right? So. It's a total match, it fits, uh, it's nice and consistent. And one of the things that kind of the ascendance of Christianity did is it motivated the study of nature to discover the mind of God, right? So if people are Christians, um, God's not really saying much anymore, but if we can uh, learn about nature, maybe we can learn about him, right? The Scala Naturae, right? Aristotle's idea of a ladder actually fits, right? If you actually go to Genesis and you read, first the plants are made, then the like less interesting animals are made, right? Fish and whales and birds. And then the mammals are made, right? The things on land, and then people are made, right? So this is essentially exactly Aristotle's ladder, right? God starts off making the bottom of the ladder and then works up to the top. So you can see how this Aristotelian idea of the scale of nature, this ladder, is reflected within this book, which now becomes a big way that people think about the world now that Christianity becomes the dominant religion. I should point out, this scale of nature is seen in other religious writings as well. This is from a totally separate kind of part of the world over in India. The ten incarnations of Vishnu, Vishnu is an Indian god or Hindu god, appeared ten times, has appeared a number of times already. The first time Vishnu came, he was a fish. The second time he was a turtle or a tortoise. Third time a boar. Then half man, half lion. Then a dwarf. Then a variety of other sorts of humans doing things and getting more and more kind of educated as he moves along, right? So this is the same sort of ladder, right? Fish to tortoise to boar and then working up to humans and people in that way. Right? You can see it depicted in pictures here where you got the fish, you got the tortoise, and then warriors and thugs and then more educated people. And this is just my favorite Hindu god. So we have the Christianity kind of shaping the way people think about things over here. Meanwhile, over back in the Middle East, we have the rise of the Islamic Empire. So that's an expansion from about 600 AD to 750 AD, and that lasts until about 1200 AD. The Islamic Empire starts with this guy, Muhammad, who is in 
Mecca. He starts a religion, he gets kicked out of Mecca, goes to Medina, and then he adds an army to his religion, and then he goes back to Mecca, and when you have an army on your side, you're a bit more effective about um, spreading your religion. So Islam spreads throughout the Middle East, and similar to Alexander the Great, Muhammad didn't have a great plan for what would happen when he died, so when he died, there were then an immediate split where one set of Muslims believed that there should be an election for the new leader, another set thought that his, um, his relative should be in charge, and you may have heard of Sunnis and Shia as different types of Muslims, and it goes all the way back to when Muhammad dies and which of these two ways of picking the successor we should have. And in fact, it's interesting to note this split between these two types of Muslims is much more ancient than the split between Catholics and Protestants, which hasn't even happened yet. Now the Islamic Empire spread, they did the same sort of thing, right? The same way of thinking in this part of the world, they're organized. At the time, they got along with Christians and Jews, they were considered people of the book because they used the Old Testament as well. So actually for quite a while here, there's a whole period of peace, right? It's different religion here, from here, but not that much conflict. Now, in this early days of Islam, we have something called the Islamic Golden Age. So this is a time when the Middle East was fairly organized, fairly peaceful, and there were many scientific, technological, intellectual advances. So this is one of the first times we see a real use of the scientific method to figure things out. The early Muslims spent a lot of time looking at the stars and figured a lot of details about astronomy. Algebra, that's an Arabic word, so algebra was invented. Trigonometry, these words have Arabic roots because they were highly developed during the Islamic and Golden Age. They figured out the difference between the absorption of light and the emission of light and did a lot of advances in optics. And they brought the concept of the number zero from India into Western mathematics. And zero is a very big, essentially technological advance in mathematics. And these Muslims, they respected Greek philosophies and writings. They had a lot of those books from the Greeks who predated them. And they did a lot of translations. And in fact, if you're a historian, much of what we know about Greek philosophers and their writings comes from writings that were preserved in the Middle East during this time and then brought back into Europe kind of at the end of this age. Because while this is going on in the Middle East, in Europe, things are actually not quite so good. So what's going on in, in Europe at this time? We have the Middle Ages, also sometimes called the Dark Ages. That's from about 480 to 1500, so that's like a thousand years. Uh, this map, <laughs> this is the map depicting the, the Black Death, right? The bubonic plague and moving around and how many people were getting killed. So for a thousand years, Europe has a whole bunch of wars and chaos. Nobody's really in charge. You have feudalism, so that's small little countries with little lords who get in fights with each other. You have barbarian invasions. Every once in a while, a, a bunch of Mongols or quote unquote barbarians would come riding in and destroy some towns and kill a bunch of people and then either go back or settle. You have the Black Plague coming in, killing a bunch of people. And then every once in a while, they would round up a bunch of healthy people they did have and then actually go over and try to invade the Middle East in the Crusades. There's no clean water at all during this time, right? So there's lots of waterborne diseases. People realize that water is causing some problems or maybe we shouldn't drink it. So in fact, they spent a lot of time drinking wine and beer. And in fact, at this time, if you could afford it, most people would be having beer or wine with every single meal. So breakfast is beer and wine and lunch and dinner. And if you think about it, for a thousand years, basically Europe is at war, being invaded, sick, and drunk. So what that means, <laughs> the purpose of science, is there's not a lot of good science going on in Europe, right? Because you kind of want peace and sobriety. There's also this attitude that Aristotle did it all. Right? He's such a famous philosopher and he was so smart and he had this scale of nature that all makes sense. Because he did it, there's no reason to like even look at nature. All you have to do is read his book. And then, yeah, a little stability to allow people to really have intellectual pursuits. So for a thousand years, Europe is not really making any intellectual progress on much at all, let alone science. There were a few medieval bestiaries written, but they had weird things like uh, when a Leo mates with a pard, they make a Leo pard. And then they would also have the phoenix and the unicorn in the book right next to horses and cows. So for about a thousand years, Europe is really not doing much. Um, we have this Islamic golden age over here, which is preserving a lot of knowledge from the Greeks that will come over later towards the end of these Middle Ages.
So the end of the Middle Ages um, happens with the Renaissance. Now, if you were like me in high school history, you may have wondered why they made such a big deal about the Renaissance. I never actually got it when I was in high school either. And the reason the Renaissance is so important is because it's the end of that thousand years of nothing that Europe went through. So the Renaissance is from about 1300 to 1600. It starts in Florence, a town in Italy. There's an increase in the arts. And um, rich people start kind of getting their own artists to kind of compete with each other for social status. And then they start getting little museums and little scientists and building things. And so basically this competition between rich people leads to an increase in intellectual pursuits and the arts spreading across Europe, right? So it's a bunch of rich people supporting artists and scientists. And then that spreads across Europe. And you get a little bit more intellectual activity going on, starting in Florence and then spreading. Another thing that happens about the same time is the Protestant Reformation. So this is around 1500 AD. Martin Luther um, had 95 complaints about the Catholic Church. So he wrote these up in a letter and basically nailed them to door, made it very public. The main thing he didn't like about the church, or one of his main things, was a thing called an indulgence. So at the time, the Catholic Church would sell these things that, well, they're like permission to sin, right, in advance. So what you would do is you would, Friday is coming up, you know you're going to sin, You'd like to sin, but you don't want to get in trouble for it. So you'd go to the church and buy, essentially, a get-out-of-jail-free card you could use on Friday. And Martin Luther thought that was terrible. The church shouldn't do that, complained about it. And a lot of people agreed with him and joined his church. Right? So that's how the Lutheran church began. And then it didn't take long after the Lutheran church kind of started its own non-Catholic type of Christianity that you get a bunch of new Christianities kind of arising in Europe just after this. And this is important, not because we care so much about religion per se, but if you remember, religion shapes people's lives and the way they think about things. And so if you have one church that's in charge of all of Europe, and had been for about a thousand years, that shapes the way people think, and they all think the same way. Once you get a bunch of new, different types of churches, that gives people different opportunities to think in different ways, right? In their different religions, they might have different ideas about things. And that diversity of ideas about everything extends to ideas about nature and about science. So we also have a scientific revolution. So we have Copernicus first publishing the heliocentric solar system, right, saying that the sun is at the middle and the Earth actually goes around the sun, which was a big change from what people thought about before. Bacon popularizing the scientific method, so actually writing that this is how we should be figuring stuff out. And then Kepler actually doing the math for um, Copernicus, um, showing that if you do some algebra and trigonometry, which they had gotten in from um, the Middle East, when you do some of the calculations, you can explain the movements of the planets, which previously had been kind of weird, right? The stars always stay in the same relative positions. The planets move around their wanderers. And he showed that you could predict this with some mathematics. So they start making mathematical predictions about the stars and the planets which start being right, and they're kind of showing people that you don't just have to like take everything as it comes and be confused about stuff. You can actually figure things out and make predictions.